Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Reta Trinkler. I'm the chairman and co-founder together with Mona Lisa of Mellonport and Marlson advisor to the Web3 Foundation. So, <laughs> um, great, so let's start with um, um, formal verification. So formal verification is um, the act of proving or disproving an algorithm um, with respect to an intended underlying algorithm. So this algorithm is specified in a, in a formal specification. So I'd like to ask all of you what makes a good specification. Um, what makes a good specification? That's a good question. So um, I think theoretically the, the answer is that the specification accurately captures the intent of the developer who wrote it. Um, making sure that's the case is obviously very difficult. So I think um, a lot of that depends on sort of your tooling and the feedback that it provides when you're writing the specification. Um, but in general, I'd say a good specification accurately reflects the intent of the developer and also encodes sort of all of the assumptions that the smart contract makes very explicitly and very clearly um, so that if someone were to update the smart contract later or something, they would all be uh, very nicely in the same place. I, I just want to add a little bit more. Uh, I think a good specification should be easy to understand and should be easy like, to, uh, for others to you know, read and you know, build test case later on. And uh, it's great if you know, it follows some standard as well. Um, I think in general, any specification is better than what most people do, which is no specification. Um, so that's probably a good place to start. Ideally, you'd you know, write a specification and then argue over that for a few days at least and then you know, write your tests and then begin coding. But a lot of people kind of do it maybe in the reverse order or something like that, or maybe they never even write a specification, so. Um, Philip's answer captures it, but uh, maybe a good specification should put a contract in a bigger picture. What kind of game people can play on it? What would be the, well, best strategy for rational players and so on? Um, yeah, if a specification fits into this crypto economic or a mechanic game theoretic reasoning that something nice, but the, yeah, this depends on the application. Thanks. So, so what is your take on um, a specification kind of, you know, specified kind of abstractly with formal methods of mathematics versus a specification implemented, for example, in Haskell? Um, so, I mean, w one is kind of like a reference implementation in, in Haskell, and the other is just kind of abstract, like purely theoretical. Well, I think that uh, um, a reference implementation in Haskell is a perfectly fine specification, honestly. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think of a specification, think of kind of just an English language document or something like that, but at least in our group, we focus a lot on executable specifications. Uh, so I think, you know, a Haskell implementation, you know, that's a whole hell of a lot better than no specification once again, and at least you can test it, right? You can, you can run tests against your specification even before you go to implementing the final thing. So that's, that's already a huge, uh, huge advantage over an English language specification, for example, but certainly English language specifications are easier to write. So maybe start with that and then do the Haskell or something like that. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with everything that was just said. Um, and I sort of want to add that you can have good or bad specifications in, in any format. So absolutely, while it's nice to have a specification be testable um, and clear and readable, you can have really, really good Haskell language specifications or you can have pretty bad Haskell uh, specifications. And I've even seen English language specifications that are not entirely bad. So sort of goes more to the expertise of whoever's implementing it, I think. Great. Um, so, like, could you maybe share a bit about what is like new and unique about um, formally verifying smart contracts, blockchains, um, kind of compared to, you know, safety critical hardware ver verification, and what are the corresponding opportunities of it? Kind of what is new and unique about formally verifying smart contracts or blockchains compared to like, for example, verifying hardware? Um, and wh what are the opportunities of it? Well, I guess um, 
smart contract has a new um, sort of like semantic, right? So we have the concept of like transaction, we have the concept of gas and so like token e and ether, um, which you know doesn't exist in in you know existing system like you know critical um, hardware or software system. Um, so when you like formally verify it, I think you you need like, to define new property that you want to verify that only exists in you know smart contract and also um, Ethereum. There's definitely some really nice things about smart contracts. Um, they're bounded in terms of their execution time. They're generally very small, simple programs, uh, at least compared to something you'd see in a safety critical system, a car or an airplane or something like that. Um, and they directly handle large quantities of money. So actually, I'm really excited. I think that uh, I said this last year, and I still strongly believe it, that as a space, we have an opportunity to set standards for how software is developed even beyond blockchains and smart contracts. Um, because I think the users of smart contracts and blockchains have a much stronger understanding and demand for this kind of technology than the users of a car or something like that. So, um, Ethereum virtual machine has no non-determined behaviors, no non-defined behaviors, because that means consensus box. So, well, so this, Possibility of uh, different clients following different folks is a huge problem, but it's a really a blessing for us on top of the virtual machine because that means the specification is really always deterministic. That's a huge improvement over proving anything over Intel chips or ARM chips. Thanks. Yeah, you wanna? Pretty much agree with what people said. The non-determinism makes it easy. The bounded gas makes it kind of nice, although sometimes it's hard to reason about exactly how much gas a contract will use. Um, and basically, you know, what's making the most driving force behind this is the amount of money being at stake, essentially, uh, as opposed to just normal programs in other settings. Let me move over because the echoes uh, really echoes make it really hard me hard for me to understand the question. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how people care a little bit more about money than their lives, right? You have someone lose their uh, 50,000 in DAO tokens and they're clamoring for formal verification, but then Toyota has an issue in their ECUs that kills 20 people and Toyota customers could not care less about the software in their car. Um, so I just think that's kind of an interesting observation on humanity. It is kind of interesting, yeah. Um, great, so could you maybe talk a bit about the limitations and challenging challenges of formal verification, and maybe also like um, introduce the, the project that you're involved with and how your project kind of tries to make things easier or better. Well, so my background interactive theorem proving is not user friendly. So take a class of computer science students of, okay, well, 30 people. Maybe a couple of them are willing to use interactive theorem provers. Maybe only one of them can finish verifying a program of like 20, 30 lines in a month or so. So it's kind of challenging. Um, actually, um, verifying software using these interactive theorem provers is so challenging that I don't see um, much, I don't see many successful applications, so, but for the reasons described before, I believe in Ethereum it might still make sense. I guess, you know, it's really hard like, to formally uh, prove, you know, uh, existing smart contract, uh, especially the uh, complicated one, because, you know, first of all, you need like, to uh, represent them in some uh, mathematical model that you can easily prove some property later on. But you know it's really hard like, to you know um, you know convert or transfer or you know uh, interpret the program into the new language or, or the new model because of the you know compa compatibility issues, right? And also sometimes you cannot even like, explore all the possible um, you know um, outcomes or you know, properties of the program. Um, and you know most of the uh, formal verification tool requires you know. Uh, strong background and and you know uh, human involved, right? And most of the project and and um, companies do do not have these you know people. So um, 
So you know, really, really, like we, we need like some sort of like um, uh, user friendly uh, developer tool, so that you know um, you can just like run the tool with some existing smart contract, and it will produce all the all the uh, helpful uh, output for for the uh, developers. Thanks. Yeah. So I work on sort of a number of projects in the correctness space. Um, one of them is I'm advising this sort of heavier weight formal verification project called KVM. Um, I'll let Everett describe that since he's actually the lead. Um, but to to speak to the broader point, I think there's like a very wide range of uh, correctness techniques that we have here, both formal, informal, and semi-formal. Um, and another one of the projects I'm on, Hydra, is sort of a lighter weight approach to this, where you abandon full formal guarantees uh, for sort of low cost uh, and easy startup, which I think is a very valuable thing to a lot of companies who aren't going to be able to, um, as Loy said, uh, hire the right people or have the right expertise. Um, at the end of the day, formal verification is still super expensive. Um, it's still hard to do, and it still doesn't give you perfect guarantees. So it's understandable why for a lot of people, especially uh, now that the tools are not totally mature, um, the business case sort of isn't there. Um, so I think we need to develop a range of techniques and ask ourselves what are really our, our high assurance contracts here um, to use our full-fledged techniques, and how can we get the other ones to a better level of security with like the lower hanging fruit techniques. Yeah, I think I agree pretty much with what Phil's saying here. Um, and actually, it makes me really happy that I see so many people just emphasizing the importance of testing and of writing specifications, because just those two steps alone uh, force you to you know, first clarify in your head, what is it I'm trying to do, which so many people don't even do. They just sit down and start kind of plonking away at code. Um, and then second, to kind of concretize that by writing some tests and then say, like, is what I did actually you know, implementing these these tests. So the tests kind of serve as a as a semi specification, if you will, or a concretization of the specification. Um, regarding the KVM project uh, that Phil mentioned, you know, I think it helps with the entire. You know, there's the entire range of of verification that you can go through. Right, you can start at testing, and you can move up to some sort of runtime verification or runtime model checking. Uh, up to model checking, which is where you explore the whole state space of a program, and then up to theorem proving, where you use more advanced techniques to prove that a program is behaving correctly. And K gives you tools uh, for all of those things, actually. So um, I think you know KVM can be a useful uh, tool in that space. It doesn't have quite a nice uh, user interface, unfortunately, so it uh, suffers from that. But um, I think it can help a lot in in all those areas. Thanks. Um, so it seems like a, a, a common uh, theme seems to be it's like too complicated. So, so how can we make tools and um, or how can we develop approaches that are more um, accessible to the end user? Um, I think in the end it's not reasonable to expect the end users to or users to read logical formulas or. Maybe K configurations are more accessible, but uh, it's hard. So at the end, what we want is a tool that can synthesize an adversary based on the unproven goals. Well, this scenario can happen, and it can play it on a uh, well, web browser. Maybe not an animation, but like um, it, it should look like somebody attacking you, your contract. Um, that would make the problem much more easier to understand. Yeah, so I guess usability is always a uh, hard problem, right? Um, and that's also like one of the motivation that why we built ONT, um, the uh, smart contract analyzer based on simple execution. Uh, so the idea here is that you know, user, they do not need to understand like how ONT works. They only need like, to paste the smart contract into ONT or into the you know, uh, web browser, and they click Analyze. And we can just like show all the possible uh, vulnerabilities that ONT can can figure out. Yeah. I uh, personally think demand sort of breeds progress in this direction. Um, and we're sitting in a room of some extremely smart and talented people, and we've seen some projects that really push the envelope in a number of spaces. And uh, while the tools are hard to use, and there certainly could be improvements made there, um, nothing here is sort of magic or anything like that. So I think sufficiently motivated developers who are incentivized by the market to develop these tools um, is really what we need to push the, uh, the envelope here. 
Um, another thing that I think is really helpful, and I'd like to uh, especially congratulate Mellonport for taking this approach, um, is to take these things out of academia and into industry and uh, use them on, on real contracts um, with real developers who are working on the ground in Solidity. Um, I think just that step could do a lot for usability, and uh, academics are not really the, the greatest at writing super usable systems sometimes, so more, more broad participation would definitely help. Yeah, thir thirding that, he just said he seconds it. Uh, but yeah, definitely the, the approach that, that Mellonport is taking seems to be the, the correct one. Just make the tools usable and make them have check for some, some specific properties automatically. Um, Certainly all of the verification tools can be instantiated to do those sorts of things, but the, you know, it takes effort and takes developer time and it takes people who know the tools to do that instantiation um, and that's not gonna happen overnight. So you know, these lighter weight methods like uh, Phil's Hydra stuff, that's really gonna be the stop gap until we can have better tooling for all these you know, high assurance tools. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> um, so, the last question from, from me and then opening it up to the audience is essentially a shout out from you guys. So um, um, what, what would you like to see kind of from different ecosystem players? So from, from the users, the developers, the investors, uh, the project leads and the researchers to make formal verification mainstream? Um, in the current ecosystem, I think it's still the user's responsibility to make sure that they understand the contract they are interacting with. Um, some people are, um, people are like proposing markets for audits and so on, but these are not working yet. So actually, I, I have to repeat Martin, I mean, it's hard to say this, but you have to read the bytecode, run the EVM in order to make sure that you are interacting with a reasonable thing. Um, it's hard to say this, but it's something like that currently. Um, and then, yes, something like audit market with reputation system or something like that will gradually may improve the situation, but um, yeah, now due diligence is required for all parties, I believe. Thanks. So I see there as sort of being two pushes that need to happen. Um, one of them is bottom up. Uh, the users need to really start demanding that if there are techniques available to ensure the correctness of, that co of their contracts, they're either used or a good justification is provided for why they're not used. Um, we certainly have a few tools right now. We've seen presentations uh, today about quite a few of them. Um, so, so users really need to start being more selective about where they put their money. Um, and while sure it's tempting to sort of buy into every single ICO and flip it for 2x or whatever, um, that's not the kind of space that sort of incentivizes and fosters uh, rigorous proper software development. Um, and so I think users and investors need to become more selective and, and developers need to sort of enable them to do that um, by really going through the processes in a way that's uh, serious and in a way that they put in a concerted effort um, to get the maximum assurance out of their contracts. Thanks. Yeah, kind of uh, echoing what Yoichi said a little bit, you know, no amount of money is a substitute for just understanding, right? So at some point you just have to read and understand the bytecode and understand how EVM works and understand how Solidity compiles to EVM or whatever tool it is, whatever high level programming language you're using, how it compiles to EVM and what the implications for security are. Uh, in that setting and you know the people doing security audits they understand this really well and they like they were saying earlier you know they just read the code and read it again and read it again and read it again you know there's no substitute for just putting time and effort into you know high assurance software well I guess you know in order to make formal verification um, popular I think we need to uh, adopt it first right um, so, I mean, I, I, I hope that we can have some sort of like ERC that, you know, that um, allows, you know, people to put, you know, maybe oriented tag, Hydra tag, or, you know, KEVM tag into every single uh, smart contract that has been, you know, deployed in the um, uh, Ethereum blockchain. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, anyone from the audience would like to ask some questions? Yes.
maybe it's better if people with questions should come to the front. That's probably a good idea for the next person. Um, uh, so from an artist standpoint, uh, how would you like to see people who provide smart contract audits uh, either contributing to your projects or using your projects? I assume it's sort of maybe one or the other, but maybe there's both for us right now. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I do do some smart contract audits, and I would say ideally the role of these kinds of tools in the long run would be to sort of put most of... Uh, that business right now out of business to an extent, like at least that's my personal goal with it. Um, in all my audits, I always make recommendations to the team about which tools are state of the art and what they should be running on their contracts. Um, certainly, auditors can run these tools on the contracts as well, but at the end of the day, my personal opinion is that it's the responsibility of the team um, and the team to sort of seek help when they're not able to do something like this, um, especially because, you know, most teams are, are, would not be willing to sort of pay the hourly for an auditor to run Securify on their code or whatever when they could do the same thing themselves. Um, so I think the role of auditors, uh, to answer your question, is to sort of inform the team about what's available and what they think could be useful for the contract, um, and then it's absolutely the team's responsibility to follow up on that and put the time in. Uh, often I think the hardest part is just the spin up time, right? So you, you have some new tool that you're trying to bring into your tool chain and then you know, it maybe takes a week or something to get it fully integrated and get it to be seamless. But once you have that spin up time taken care of, then you can kind of begin to make incremental progress. So what I would like to see is uh, people taking the case semantics and making extensions of it. So we have already several extensions. One is a small gas analysis tool that's not um, very featureful or very complete or sound. It just kind of gives a rough estimate, but it'd be nice to kind of tighten the screws on that. Um, and then there's another tool called EVM Prime, which is just a small extension of the EVM semantics to a higher level language. And if people wanted to hack on that, that would be really cool. I'm answering specifically for KVM because um, that's you know the project I'm working on. Um, but there's all sorts of other analysis tools you can write directly in K itself as an extension of language. And the hard part is the spin up time on K, of course. But you know, there's no, there's no avoiding that with a project like that, so. Yeah, um, just to butt in, uh, just for one second. Um, it would be really nice also if these auditors and these teams sort of complained a lot more about the tools. Bueno, bueno. <laughs> yep. uh, so, so far, most of the research uh, focused around either token or crowd sale, which are relatively smaller size, and they also it's quite similar, but as, more, more companies start uh, delivering the product which they promise to do based on the funding, the size is going to be a lot bigger and the product will be quite diverse. What would be the challenge when it comes to verifying these actual product uh, rather than like talking in the crowd sales? Thanks. Uh, please, quick answer because we need to... Um, sorry, the question was, what are the challenges for these teams that are using these tools mostly? It's better without the mic, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the question was about like most of the verification right now is tokens or crowd sales because that's sort of what everyone's doing and it's all the same, but what about when we get more complicated contracts? Um, I personally think people are always gonna sort of push the envelope and do things that are more complicated than we actually can verify um, and I think that's really cool to sort of feed back in, but the more complicated, the more experimental your contract is, the more time you're gonna have to take and the, the more you're gonna have to consult experts who really know how to write like new specifications and not just reuse those same old building blocks um, in the old ones. I, I think auditing or make, finding bugs in the contracts is a bad game to play because you have to beat the best attackers in the world so um, going forward, if you try more, more and more complicated stuff, you will need a much stronger usable tools. Otherwise, um, so I mean, the game is not fair. You have to find all holes. And a very good attacker should find only one, go one hole, critical vulnerability, 
So it's very skewed. It's a very very skewed game. So maybe a good tooling or maybe a good game like Hydra is necessary. But I think we are kind of ready to that, take the challenge. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. Um, that concludes the panel. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Like it's a huge honor to share the stage with, with some of the best researchers in, in the field. Thanks very much. Thank you.